So we want to continue our discussion today of the loanable funds model or the supply and demand for credit model by talking about forces on the supply side of the market that influence the supply of credit and therefore interest rates. Uh, let's talk about the, we'll have three different sectors that we want to talk about. Uh, the first one, we want to talk about the household sector. And the household sector is just people living in households, either by themselves or with other people. Uh, very often, these are families. And so the contribution the household sector makes to the supply of credit is through saving. And everybody's heard about saving, putting your money away today to spend it on a later day. Um, let's talk a little bit about, the, uh, in order to understand the way people save, let's talk about their behavior in terms of their income. This is their after-tax income. Some people will call that disposable income. There's two things to do with our income after ta paying taxes. One is we spend it, and that's called consumption spending. And the other is saving. Now that seems uh, easy enough, but it can be a little bit easier if we recognize this, that there's not consumption spending and saving. Instead, there's consumption spending, I'll take my income, I'll spend it now. And then there's also, I won't spend it now, I'll spend it later. So this is spending or consumption spending later. Sometimes that later would be after retirement, but sometimes it would just be a few, year down, a few years down the road. You might save money for five years and then buy a car. And so you have saved your money in the, for the first five years, and then you consume that, spend that money at a later date. So anyway, all we have really is two choices with our income after taxes. The one is, will I spend the money now? And the other, will I spend the money later? Okay, now... What we find out that is important, and you know, you can kind of consider yourself here with you've got this question, which way should I go? Should I spend my money now? Should I spend my money later? One of the things that influences that decision is the interest rate. And the reason I say the interest rate is important is this. If we will not spend our money now, you know, and let's say we'll put aside $100 right now, and we think instead about spending that money just one year later, if the interest rate is 5%, then a year from now we'd have $105 to spend. And then we'd have a choice to make. Hey, would I rather have $100 worth of goods and services today or $105 worth of goods and services later? And a lot of people will go ahead and say, hey, you know, I'm going to spend my money today. I'm not going to spend it later. But the thing is, when that interest rate changes, let's say it's 10% or 15 or 20%, and that's pretty high, but if that interest rate's 20%, now we have a choice. Do I want to spend my money today? I have $100. Or if I can wait for a year, I'd be able to spend $120. And so the point is that the higher that interest rate is, the higher the reward is for postponing your spending today and spending later instead. So let me draw a graph that goes along with this. It's pretty simple. But what we're showing is this. We'll measure funds down here, just the funds that you have saved, and then interest rate on the vertical axis. And what we're saying is that something like this happens, that as the interest rate goes up, there's a greater and greater reward for postponing your spending today and spend later instead. And so what we would find is if the interest rate's 2%, there'd be just a little bit of saving. If the interest rate goes up to 5%, there's considerably more saving. And then if the interest rate goes up to 8%, uh, more saving still. And so we're moving along this curve. And as I say, this curve, it's, we call it saving, but it's what, what do I not spend out of my income now that I will spend later? So here's the first thing, and these funds go into credit markets. Uh, what a lot of people will do is they will buy bonds, for example, or other people might put their money in a savings account. But either way, if you're buying bonds, you're lending money to the bond issuers. If you put your money into a savings account at the bank, the bank will lend your money out to people uh, like businesses and so forth. So either way, these savings of yours work their way into the credit markets. They're supplying credit and putting downward pressure on interest rates. Okay, let's talk about a second group. The second group that we want to talk about, and this is really kind of two groups, but we're going to talk about the Federal Reserve and the banks 
as a single group. Okay. Uh, the reason that we're going to put the Federal Reserve and the banks together as this financial sector is we're really talking about Federal Reserve policy, monetary policy. The Federal Reserve wants to increase the money supply and credit supply, but the Federal Reserve doesn't do that by itself. It operates through the banking system. So there's really, and we'll kind of get into this in a moment, but there's really kind of a two-part aspect of this. And so consider if the Federal Reserve decides, you know, the money or the economy is not performing very strongly. We'd like to give it a little boost. If the Federal Reserve decides to do that, then what it will do, the first step of that boost, is it will go to bankers and say, we'd like to buy some bonds from you. We'd like to buy treasury bonds from you or some other kinds of bonds. But that's the Federal Reserve's first step. The second thing that happens is this. The bankers say, okay, and they'll turn their bonds over to the Federal Reserve. Here you go, and the Federal Reserve will pay them. And the way the Federal Reserve pays banks is by putting funds or crediting their reserve account. And so the bankers have handed over bonds to the Fed. The bankers get back funds from the Federal Reserve, and now those funds are just sitting there and not earning interest. And before very long, that is to say one day, uh, what will happen is those bankers are sitting there with these funds that they receive from the Federal Reserve, not earning interest, and they'll say, we ought to put this money to work. And the way they normally would put it to work is by making loans to businesses. And so the Federal Reserve buys the bonds from the banks. The banks now have the payment for the bonds sitting as idle funds, and then the banks make loans. And those making loans means supply of credit. Okay, let me kind of trace this out. Fed buys bonds from banks. Banks hold excess reserves, and those excess reserves are from the bond sales the Federal Reserve paid into the bank's reserve account, and then the banks make loans. And those loans are new credit supply. So there's the logical process that we go through. Let's talk just for a moment then about the supply curve, the Federal Reserve's monetary policies. What will happen is something like this. The Federal Reserve, the officials, will get it in mind. And later on in the class, we will, uh, like in a few weeks, we will get around to talking about the Federal Reserve's policies. But for right now, what we need to know is this, is that the Federal Reserve is saying something like, we need to pump a billion dollars into of uh, funds into credit markets and they've got a number like that in mind and so what's going to happen is there's going to be a change in the money supply from the Federal Reserve the Federal Reserve is not really interested in the credit markets per se the Federal Reserve's real interest is the economy but they say in order for us to achieve our economic goals that we have for policy we're going to pump a billion dollars worth of credit into the system and so this is the supply of funds new supply of funds it's related to a change in the money supply and here is the supply curve from the Federal Reserve and I'll say Fed plus banks and so this is a second source of uh, credit supply throughout the year, whatever the Federal Reserve is doing to the monetary policy. Okay? I've drawn this to be a vertical curve because a while ago when we were talking about household saving, what we said is as the interest rate goes up, it's an incentive to you, a homeowner, an individual, it's your incentive to save a little bit more because you get a bigger reward later on. Uh, the higher the interest rate is, your reward for saving goes up, and so you're more prone to do that. The Federal Reserve is not motivated by this kind of self-interest or profit-seeking idea. Uh, their goal is, in this particular case, we want to pump $1 billion of money and credit into the economy. And so that's how much they want to put into the economy, whether the interest rate is low or medium or high. So this is just a vertical curve. It is an amount the Fed wants to inject into the economy. Okay. Okay, so our third sector that we want to talk about is the foreign sector. 
You may not think about this very much, but a substantial amount of funds come to the United States from people overseas. Uh, and we get that from a couple of different places. One is people overseas have income and they save money out of their income. Some of that saving they put in their bank accounts and so forth right there near their houses. But sometimes foreigners will have money and they will save by sending their money to the United States, maybe into a bank account, maybe into some bonds. Uh, another place that that foreign saving comes from is sometimes it's governments overseas. Uh, the government of China, for example, accumulates substantial funds that are generated through exports by that nation. So they've got a lot of funds and they say, hey, what are we going to do with these funds? Answer, let's loan those out and get some interest. Well, where do they loan that, those funds? And the answer is China lends funds in many different places, but their number one place to lend funds is in the United States. And they will send... Uh, like I say, their foreign exchange earnings from exports, they will send those to the United States and buy U.S. Uh, Treasury bonds, Treasury bills, notes, and bonds. So anyway, let's put this third sector down as the foreign sector. Okay? And we'll recognize the foreign sector is a third major sector that's generating earnings for the U.S. economy. Um, let me draw a graph, it will say funds, and this is funds into the U.S. credit markets, and here's the interest rate, okay, and this curve that I draw is going to be a little bit different than the others, and what makes it a little bit different is, here I have it kind of going to the left, of zero, and now these would be negative amounts. And so what this is telling us is as interest rates go up in the United States, foreigners send more funds to the United States, but if interest rates go below a certain level, then those funds don't come to the United States. They actually leave the United States and go, funds go in search of um, uh, higher interest overseas. Okay, and so for example, if we were thinking about uh, some, let's say, finance minister in China says, oh, I've got a billion dollars to lend, where am I going to put that? If interest rates are 2% in the rest of the world, and they were 1% in the United States, then the Chinese foreign minister would say, yeah, I'm not going to put money in the United States. In fact, I'm going to take it out of the United States, money we've lent in the past, and we're going to put it overseas. Okay, so this is the competing rate is where we break this you know, this plane and go to negative amounts. So anyway, assuming that interest rates are high enough in the United States, increases in the interest rate above this world level would mean that more and more funds come to the United States from overseas. And so if the interest rates, let's call that was two, if the interest rate's 3% here in the United States, we get a fairly small amount from overseas. If the interest rate's 10% in the United States, we get a large amount from overseas. And so this is our, the, the foreign sector, how it will affect the U.S. economy. Okay, now, what we want to do, we've got these three different sectors that are supplying funds in the U.S. Uh, credit markets. What we want to do is draw the graph for each one. Here's the saving by households. Here's the change in the money supply by the Federal Reserve and the banks. And then here's the foreign saving and we want to just add those three curves together and find out what they tell us about the total supply of credit. So here we go. We'll have three of these curves side by side. And then the fourth one will be the total supply of credit. Funds in each case. Now, what we want to start with, let's take the, we'll kind of do these in reverse order maybe. We'll take this foreign supply first, and we'll put that supply of funds in U.S. credit markets coming from overseas. We've got a graph for that. We'll take a, a second graph, will be S, this will be saving, I'll say HH, saving by households. And then the third one of these that we'll draw is the 
change in the money supply, which would be savings by, or the funds injected into credit markets by the Federal Reserve and the banking system. Okay. And now what we want to do is just pick any old interest rate and come across here. This is the process of horizontal summation, and we will add these three amounts. Okay. At that interest rate, let's say a 3% rate, how much do foreigners send to the United States? How much do Americans save? And how much is the Federal Reserve and the banking system together creating of new money and credit throughout the year? And let's put numbers on these. Let's say this is 40 50 and 60. Those are very convenient, aren't they? And so 40 plus 50 plus 60 add up to 150. And so that would be the total amount of saving at, what I say, 3% interest rate. If the interest rate happens to be higher, let's take 5%. I'll just do one more of these. If the interest rate is at 5% now, what we do is we ask how each sector responds to that 5% interest rate. So the foreign sector now is going to spend, or send, pardon me, uh, let's say $75 million, uh, billion, dollars, trillion dollars, whatever number you want to work with, $75 to the United States credit markets. Let's say households here in the United States save 65. The Federal Reserve is responsible and the banking system for a number, another 60. So 75 and 65 is 140, and 60 more is 200. Is that possible? Yeah, I guess it is. 200. And so now at a 5% interest rate, the total quantity supplied of credit would be $200. And we can connect the dots. We could do everything at 5.1%, 5.2%, 5.3%. And we just get a whole series of dots, and we would get something that looks like this. And this is the total supply of credit that encompasses all three components of supply that we've already talked about. Okay. So what do we have? We have a total supply curve for credit. There was already a total demand curve that was derived from these two other things, the household or the business sector borrowing, and then the government deficit. Those two things added together give a total demand for credit, and so we put the total supply and the total demand for credit together, and that's where we'll find the equilibrium. or a flow of funds publication. And what that does is it looks at all of the funds coming into the United States from overseas and all the funds within the United States but that are being supplied in these financial markets. So how much does the household sector put into checking accounts? How much does the household sector put into savings accounts? How much does the household sector invest in bonds? How much does the household sector uh, maybe lend to other people in the household sector? And it just goes through like each sector What's it doing with its funds? And then that way we've got this giant table that basically ties together everybody that is demanding credit and everybody that is supplying credit. And we've got some dollar amounts for each one of those. So that's what underlies all this. But the point is, if you just look at the flow of funds table, what you say is, wow, it's a mess. How do I make order of this? And the way to make order out of it is some people in the, and, and organizations uh, but some people and organizations in the full funds table are supplying funds, others are demanding funds. And so the first thing we want to do is separate those out conceptually and see what side of the market on, are they on. Are they putting downward pressure on interest rates or are they putting upward pressure on interest rates? What we'll do in our next discussion is do just what I mentioned a moment ago. We've got all of the components of supply. We already talked about the components of demand. So our next step is to bring together the total supply of funds with the total demand for funds and find out what the equilibrium interest rate is. So long.